you know, this is one of those topics that is very important that a lot of people don't know much about, and somehow they think they do. Um, and, and it's a topic, in my opinion, that affects everyone, not just in this room, but people that aren't in this room, and they don't even know it. Uh, because maybe they haven't been touched by it yet. They're not aware of how many ways this reaches out and touches families, individuals, friends, neighbors. And so when we talked about having a town hall on this, uh, we decided to impanel uh, experts. There's a lot of experts in the crowd. Um, and some of the experts come to be an expert not by a path that they chose, but because they were tragically impacted by the impact of the loss of a loved one or a friend. And so the purpose of this primarily is education, to educate the community. And to that end, we thank Bloomfield Township Ca uh, Cable Vision for making this. And they're going to make it available uh, publicly. So hopefully people that didn't make it or couldn't make it will be able to watch some of the experts and some of the thoughts and processes here. And probably we can bicycle it, bicycle it I think that's the term, to other cable channels that have cable systems as well as a public service. <clears throat> so in any event, <clears throat> I'm uh, Mike Bouchard, I'm the Oak County Sheriff, and we've got a lot of folks uh, that will be speaking to the situation, and somewhere in my pocket I stuck some of the things that I thought would be kind of illustrative of what we're facing, and some of the numbers that we're seeing uh, in Oakland County. But it, you know, Oakland County is just a mirror of any place USA. It's happening everywhere. And sometimes it, it displaces other drugs of choice. Fentanyl has displaced um, meth in many communities because uh, fentanyl is so cheap, so incredibly cheap, and so accessible and available. And to, to make that point, um, the narcotics enforcement team that is here in Oakland County that's made up, it's in our sheriff's office, but it's made up of a consortium of local and federal agencies, a good partners uh, all. Um, we pulled some statistics on the seizures of fentanyl that we have seen right here in Oakland County. In 2019, there was about 240 grams of fentanyl that was seized. In 2021, it was about 223 grams. As of today, in 2024, there's already 811 grams that have been seized. So you can see there's an exponential increase in the fentanyl seizures. What you're not seeing is there's even a greater exponential increase, uh, when I was talking to our narcotics investigators, of the availability and the lowered price point. And so we know it's coming in a variety of ways. We know it's coming from China, synthetic fentanyl and other fentanyl uh, labs, factories, if you will, that are producing it in great quantities and it comes in through a variety of ways, not the least of which huge amounts are coming across the southern border. Um, but it has come in such quantities, again, that you're seeing it in everything. And so, you know, if you happen to be a marijuana user, and in Michigan, marijuana is legal, I will tell you, you should go to a licensed, regulated, and inspected dispensary. Because marijuana we have seized on the street has had fentanyl. It's been laced with fentanyl. So you never know what you're getting out on the street. And sometimes it could be a friend, a relative, a son or a daughter, and they may think they're getting something and they're getting something completely different. And the same goes true with pills. They may think they're getting an Adderall or a Valium or whatever the case may be. And it's actually a counterfeit pill and a pill press and we're working in Washington to try to serialize pill presses and make it a crime if they're not, <clears throat> because there's such a proliferation of that. So I'm head of government affairs for Major County Sheriff's of America, and we're working on that to begin to try to find a path for accountability on the counterfeit pills and pill presses, because what you're seeing, again, they think they might be getting a Valium or an Adderall, and it's got fentanyl. And as I talked to the DEA administer, uh, when I was with her in Washington recently, they've got a, a, a program which she said we can steal, which I'm happy to steal, called One Pill Can Kill. Because you never know what's in that pill. And one pill can be lights out. 
And that's the danger, that's the reality we're facing as a community, as parents, as grandparents, friends and neighbors, is they may end up with something in their hand and, and ingest it and have no idea. And, and, a, and actually what it is is poisoning. They have no idea what they're getting. They're poisoned with fentanyl and didn't bargain for that, didn't want that, and end up dead. And so <clears throat> that's part of what we want to educate the community. And the pathway to this problem sometimes, if they're seeking a particular pill, maybe it's pain medication, can come through so many different ways. It can come through a sports injury. It can come through oral surgery. And then when the pills run out, they go to the street to find a similar pain relief or self-medicating for a mental health challenge. And they have no idea what they're getting. And again, one pill can kill or whatever they get. And so that kind of tells you the scope of the problem um, in terms of the drugs that are coming in, including large, large quantities of synthetic fentanyl. But here's the statistics from 2019 to 24 today, as of today. In Oakland County, there were 12,990 uh, overdoses of whatever in that opioid family. There were 5,899 opioid interrupters applied in those overdoses to try to stop that from killing the person. But out of those numbers, 1,648 perished. 1,648 souls in Oakland County died as a result of this death that's being sold intentionally across our country. And that number is staggering. Again, that's friends, families, neighbors, sons and daughters. Uh, my daughter played soccer in this area, and three of the girls she played soccer with died. Um, they came via sports injuries and ended up, you know, on the wrong end of that equation, like so many other families. So if you don't think it can affect you, you at home and you in this room, I think I'm kind of preaching to the choir. But at home and folks that didn't show up, I, I don't think most people realize the scope of this and the probability that someone in your family is going to be touched by this. And, you know, when I first went to the legislature to ask them to allow law enforcement to carry Narcan. It took me two years to get permission to have law enforcement carry it. We had to fight for it. And now typically we save over 100 lives every year by just the sheriff's office. So imagine how many lives could be saved across the whole state of Michigan in those two years that they were doing something more important, like maybe changing the state flower. Yeah, I'm a little frustrated with <laughs> some of the lack of activity we get out of our legislators these days, if you can tell. Um, here's some of the preliminary statistics as of 2024, just the year to date. 79 deaths, 24 female and 55 male, 31 in January, 32 in February, 16 in March, the toxicology reports tell us that 71% of those cases had fentanyl. And when we did an anecdotal check, I went to my crime lab and said, what are we seeing in the lab? Not just in, like, we know this is fentanyl, but in everything you're testing. And they told me on that day it was about 80% had fentanyl in it. So obviously that lines up with the toxicology, about 71.7% .7 had fentanyl uh, in the toxicology reports. And here's another statistic that is uh, an interesting, it's hard to explain trend, but there's been a divergence, if you will, that now more men are dying in a, a sharp spike. Um, originally, it was about 20, or excuse me, 72 um, percentage of, let me back up here, it was about 34% female and 65% 60, um, that were in, involved with fentanyl. So out of the females that overdosed on something, about 66% had fentanyl involvement. And this is women. <clears throat> and 34% um, did not. With the men, 76% had fentanyl involvement. And here's where I was talking about the statistics growing, where 
it's largely begun to separate and many, many more males are dying for some odd reason than females. Like statistically, it's nowhere close. And I don't know how to answer that question and maybe someone on our panel does about that divergence. Um, so at any rate, that just kind of sets the backdrop and I know that the Chief Gallagher got some of the recent stats, you know, how it's bracketed by age but it's an equal opportunity destroyer. It does tend to bulk up in the ages 22 up to about, well, it's really spread out. The gap has begun to grow even wider. It's all the way up to age 65 now. So again, you know, it's, it's everywhere in every age as I look at the trend lines on the age. So that's kind of the backdrop and we're seeing it get nothing but worse. Um, we've tried to respond at the sheriff's office with our partners, the Oakland County um, Health Authority, um, with our partners at the coalition. Um, on so many levels, you know, we've got the Narcan vending machines out with our partners. We've been doing rides for recovery at the sheriff's office. We do medically existent treatment in the jail, and we have free vending machines for when you leave. Um, we are partnering now on a program. They'll get into all this, so I don't want to get too in depth, but now some aftercare and some follow up when they leave the jail because we know the first two weeks when they get out of jail, there's a huge exponential likelihood that they're, they might die um, after they've been clean in the jail and they've gone through our treatment. So, you know, we're involved on many levels. We actually started a program that got national awards called Operation Medicine Cabinet, where we take uh, medicines out of the home, especially end of life. Last time you'll see stacks of medicines on the nightstand, including morphine and things. How do you get it out of the house without putting it into the toilet and our waters and streams? And so we've had a program for many, many years. There's uh, boxes all across the county. I think 40 some boxes where they're like the old blockbusters at police stations. You can put them in there, no questions asked. Just get them out of the house, get them away from being you know, diverted, used, sold, or flushed. And so we've got a multi-layer approach, but we need more. You know, we're not gonna arrest our way out of it. A component of the whole thing is to arrest the people who are profiting off of people's deaths. People that are selling this intentionally, making money, should do hard time, in my opinion. But everybody else is basically a victim to this, this profit scheme. They're being poisoned sometimes completely, uh, without their knowledge and they're being tricked into taking things that they think are something different and so on so many levels we need education we need treatment we need diversion we need tons of things that aren't law enforcement but because we're always the first call we have to be in in very close partnership with those folks and we have our own crisis response unit I'm super proud of that does that kind of thing that follows up and actually was checking on somebody and followed up and found that person in active overdose and saved their life a second time. Um, and so, you know, we're gonna have to do more together to affect this trend line. I mean, there is a law enforcement component and that is how do we get other countries from sending this garbage into us? How do we stop that? That is the law enforcement and the international component. But in the meantime, how do we educate our community to the realities of this danger so we quit losing 100,000 plus men and women every year? I mean, think about that number. For three years running, we've lost 100,000 people in this country to these kinds of tragedies. And it literally affects everyone. So uh, I won't prattle on. We're going to definitely have some experts talk yet and we'll have some Q&A and, and I know I've, as I said we've got some experts in the audience um, that have been touched by tragedy personally uh, two of whom I know very well myself and I will, I'm sure hear from them we've got a, a mic that we'll throw open but let's start with the panel we'll start uh, on my right your left and we'll move through the panel and they can do a far better job of telling you who they are and their expertise Okay, thank you so much, and thank you for having me. My name is Chris Perry. I'm the executive director of the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Um, we are a fund that is uh, housed under the umbrella of the Children's Foundation, and our focus is on substance use disorder among children's teens and young adults. 
So a lot of the conversation tonight obviously is around adults, but we look at it from the perspective of the child, not only from a prevention and recovery standpoint, but also in reducing the stigma and looking at the child that's been impacted by parents who've potentially struggled with substance use disorder. So you, Chair, if you mentioned 1,648 people perished in the last four or five years, how many, of it were, how many parents were struggling because they lost a child? How many children were struggling because they lost a parent? And those, those children who are from a home who's dealing with substance use disorder or fentanyl, um, they're much more, they're a higher risk of mental health issues, higher risk of, in, uh, of developing a substance use disorder themselves, higher risk of struggling in schools. So this uh, issue around fentanyl and, this, and, the, and, and substance use disorder impacts all aspects of our community, like you had mentioned, including which we look at mostly the children. Uh, so my name is Steve Norris. I am the Director of Harm Reduction and Recovery Support at the Alliance of Coalitions. And we at the Coalition or the Alliance uh, serve a bunch of different purposes in our community. I'll try to highlight a few of the most, um, predominantly the most important ones related to the fentanyl issue at hand. Uh, we serve as the uh, honorary stakeholder for the Overdose Fatality Review Board for Oakland County, which reviews every month individually cases of overdoses in our community to find out the failures in our system where we can do better uh, as stakeholders in our community to provide better levels of services, where gaps in services exist so that we can identify failures, not so much from the perspective of judgment, but from the perspective of doing a better job for our community. The other thing we do is we have the incredible honor and privilege of serving alongside with the Oakland County Sheriff's Office in the response with the Crisis Response Unit. And so we have peer navigators embedded uh, with officers in the field, uh, running calls for the most part seven days a week in response to post overdose um, related to actually getting people connected to the robust services that are available here in Oakland County. And I think one of the issues that we have here in Oakland County is that we have a lot of services available that not too many people know about. So we champion that message um, alongside all the wonderful people here on this panel um, to try to raise awareness about access to those and make it easy and simple. Uh, one of the other things that we do is serve alongside, uh, again, uh, Oakland Community Health Network in the um, training of crisis intervention. Uh, when officers are responding to calls, substance and or mental health, we're able to uh, use our experience in the field having mostly a staff built with lived experience, um, be able to share those lived experience with those officers so that they can uh, approach those scenes um, from a more compassionate and understanding response um, and really connect with the human beings on that level. Um, and so that's an incredible privilege that we have. And lastly, um, with the help of <laughs> the Sheriff's Office one more time, um, we're bringing revolutionary medications to the forefront of the fight including Nalmaphene, uh, which is the brand name Opvi, uh, very different from, from naloxone in the terms of its chemical makeup. Uh, there's only clinical trials done. We happen to be the first uh, county in the entire United States to be able to test and see whether or not these drugs are effective. And so far, those results have been absolutely incredible with over 72 reversals in the last four months with one dose of medication that isn't producing negative outcomes such as precipitated withdrawal that we see so often when naloxone's improperly given in our community at higher rates. And so lastly, we serve as the trainer for Oakland County in the OEND, which is opioid education, uh, overdose education, and naloxone distribution, which Sheriff Bouchard uh, pointed out um, with the help of all these stakeholders, we've been able to, in the last 11 and a half months, uh, place 100 Save a Life stations throughout the county that is literally a no barrier access to harm reduction supplies such as fentanyl testing strips, uh, xylazine testing strips, fentanyl, um, I'm sorry, um, naloxone, resource guides, anything that someone may need uh, that's currently um, using actively 
uh, and also connect them to resources so that they know they don't have to fight this alone and that there are people like us in the community that have fought the fight and hopefully on the other side that can share our experiences with them and get them connected to services that they deserve. And so we'll pass it off to Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Megan Phillips. I am the director of SUD Services for Oakland Community Health Network, uh, OCHN. We are the um, public, uh, the PIHP. Uh, so essentially, that means we uh, handle all the Medicaid specialty dollars for Oakland County in terms of SUD prevention, treatment, and recovery services. Um, in also, it's not just the Medicaid dollars, but then also our uh, what we call block grant dollars. So for those people who have no insurance or they have a third party insurance um, that they receive through a spouse, a loved one, a family member, um, a lot of times just because somebody has insurance doesn't mean that they can afford that insurance. And so that is part of what we do at OCHN. We step in and we fund those that are deemed as underinsured. They couldn't afford treatment services uh, without financial assistance. Um, what we do for the county is we provide all of the prevention, treatment, and recovery services through our provider network. So for prevention, um, the Alliance of of course, is one of our prevention providers. They have all of the um, community coalitions that sit underneath of them that they manage. Um, they uh, handle the Save a Life stations and, and many of our initiatives that we do um, in terms of treatment services. Um, as Sheriff Bouchard said, we have uh, medication assisted treatment that is offered in the jail um, because what we see is a significant amount of individuals who leave jail, they're at extremely high risk of overdose um, and death when they leave the jail and they have um, not, um, in their ex they use a substance when they leave. Um, so we offer all three FDA approved medications in the uh, jail, uh, the Vivitrol, Suboxone, Sublocade, and Methadone. Uh, we also offer clinical services, peer services, and then the medical services as well from one of our contracted providers. Uh, we then have treatment services, the standard withdrawal management and residential, medication-assisted treatment in the community, um, standard outpatient. We have women's specialty services. That is huge because uh, for some parents, and it's called women's specialty by the state, but essentially it is for any person who's the primary caregiver um, in their family. And what can happen at times is a person is in need of treatment services, but they're the primary caregiver for that child that they have in their home. And so we have treatment services at the withdrawal management and residential level that you are able to take your child with you to treatment. Um, those who are school aged, they are able to take their kids with them, have the kids enrolled in the area school to still receive those services. And then at an outpatient level with those women's specialty services, uh, there is daycare on site for a parent to be able to come in, have the children watched, be able to receive their clinical services, um, and uh, then also transportation is also offered because that can be a barrier for services as well. Um, in terms of uh, people who are seeking immediate services. Oh, this one is so important. Um, we uh, run, we fund, uh, we develop the concept of the sober support unit. It is run by one of our contracted providers. It is located at the Resource and Crisis Center right here on this campus. Um, and essentially it allows somebody access to withdrawal management and residential treatment 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's huge um, because at any point in time, someone who's struggling uh, with their substance abuse, they can make that decision, I want to go into treatment services. It could be two in the morning after they've overdosed, they're leaving the ER. It could be on Christmas Day. It can be on New Year's Day. It can be at four in the morning, five at night, 365 days a year, seven days a week, 24 hours a day, that sober support unit is open. A person just has to walk in, say, I want treatment services. They will be given a bed, they will be given food, they will be given comfort medications, and the treatment provider will come and pick them up for treatment services in less than 24 hours. A person can walk in with absolutely nothing. 
um, and they can go off to that treatment provider and any of the basic needs that a person has, that treatment provider will be able to help assist them um, with uh, you know, basic clothes and hygiene and what their needs are there. Um, for recovery services, we have our peer recovery coaches. That's such a huge piece of the treatment and recovery process a person goes through. Um, our peers are one of our best tools in working with people because they have been there. They have that lived experience. They have walked the walk, and it is a very dark walk uh, for someone who's struggling with a substance use disorder, and nobody knows that walk better than somebody who has lived through that walk. They have gone through the darkest times, and they have been able to pull themselves out of it um, and to do the recovery work. And so for people who are struggling and newly in recovery, our peers who are embedded at every treatment level from withdrawal management, residential, to the sober support unit, um, they really uh, are able to work with the person on what any of their challenges are. You know, what is it that you're facing? I, you know, the shame that somebody feels for from their substance use. I think that's something that is not talked about enough. It is a disease that is so shame-filled for people who are struggling. Um, and I think the stigma that also still surrounds substance abuse, it's something that we continually try to work on um, within our organization, with getting out our messaging to the public, with the advertising that we do, with the ad campaigns we do. One of the things that I personally do whenever I talk about people in recovery is, is I try to really change the language. And one of those ways is, you know, for someone who's in recovery, I refer to them as a recovery warrior because that's exactly what they are. They have walked through depths that no, gen no person who has ever experienced that, they could not handle it and they could not do it. People who are in recovery have really gone to the darkest corners and come back and there are people that should be hailed as a hero because they have gone through something that no one can truly understand. Um, they have gone from a place of feeling and wanting to die and not feeling that they're good enough to raising out of that and everyone that I know in recovery, they are some of the most successful and determined people that I have ever met in my entire life. Um, so with that, I will turn it over now. Good evening. Uh, I'm Chief Jim Gallagher from Bloomfield Township Police Department. Uh, and thanks, Sheriff, for inviting us out. Um, I just represent one of, one of the local police chiefs uh, in Oakland County who partners with the Sheriff's Department. Uh, many of us are involved in the Oakland County Narcotics Enforcement Team. And when the sheriff asked if, if I'd come tonight, um, the answer is absolutely, because when we speak with OCHN, um, we recognize that when they talk about walking in the darkest moments, it's our officers and our deputies that are actually responding to those runs uh, when people are in their darkest moments. And so there had to be a mind shift um, in our career field, over the, and it's really taken shape, I think, over the last three or four years. Um, of. Really, what do we do? What's our role when we're, we're responding to these uh, these types of incidents? Uh, overdoses don't listen. This doesn't affect one population, one race, one social economic status, one Republican Democrat. But it it, it affects every single uh, person along along the way, and. We're the ones who are responding and seeing on a daily basis in Oakland County. And again, I know some of the families in here, I've seen them and speak, and you'll probably hear some of their stories, I'm sure. Um, but when we look at our kids, if you have children, we should be looking at their kids if they're ours, because that's exactly what they thought um, at one point in time as well. This is not something, when, when Sheriff and I talked today, um, when I have to call and get stats from the medical examiner's office, um, that, that should be an alarming that's a problem that we face. Um, and just because we say we're Oakland County, one of the wealthiest or one of the most you know, educated wealth in, in the whole country, um, it affects it here. And I was at a uh, Oakland County Narcotics Advisory meeting not too long ago, um, and their commander of the, the narcotics team gave, us, uh, gave me the price or told a lot of the local chiefs, but what the cost of a, of a kilo of cocaine is, most of us in this room wouldn't even think about why that's important to a community. But when he adds to it that that's the cost of the, uh, it's about the cost now of what the crack pandemic or crack epidemic was in the late, uh, you know, in the 80s, um, that's a problem. 
Um, and when I look at the stats that mostly males and you know are dying of fentanyl overdoses because that's what cocaine's cut with. There's really no heroin anymore. Um, back when I was doing narcotics investigations, heroin was was what we were seeing laced with um, with fentanyl. But with cocaine making its right way back in, a, a cocaine is a is a suburban drug. It's a high you know drug that is used at, and by people who are high energy at their jobs, high demands at their jobs, and they're trying to stay. So for us, for me to see some of these stats, it's not surprising. Um, and it's not surprising to see that I work in a very affluent community, well-educated, that it affects our community as well. Um, you know, I had the opportunity, and, and I'm going to call him out in here, but my, my first training officer is in the room, um, and him and I spoke this morning about us, uh, about his job now. He's in the private sector, and I believe it was just this winter around that time, five individuals in a private business uh, or, or close to it all, all within a very short period of time either overdosed or died um, from that and, and in his experience as a law enforcement officer can only help uh, the company he works for now but who would have thought going to a private security or, or for a private business was taking you right back uh, to the job that he started doing so I, I think it's that important um, we need to be educated I'm here to be educated by the community um, and things that we can learn and things that you want us to address uh, we're very fortunate that we were part of uh, one of the pilot groups for our co-responder program um, with partner with OCHN and uh, our, uh, Bloomfield Township, Birmingham and Auburn Hills initially started the uh, co-responder program. Uh, we added the city of Rochester and we were able to hire a second clinician with us. It since then has transitioned into uh, the sheriff's department with uh, one in Pontiac. I believe nine more for the sheriff's department will be hired soon. Uh, the cities of Royal Oak, Ferndale, Madison Heights and Hazel Park I believe are jumping on board. Um, and again that goes into that transition of what we're trying to see in law enforcement. Before it was arrest and prosecute and, and, and deal with it. Now it's how do we save lives um, in, in this problem that we're seeing our officers are carrying if, if, if you could watch our officers walk out to a patrol car now with their duty bag their AED their Narcan their um, whatever other information that they have to have they really need a golf cart to take them out to their patrol cars um, and so it's that important and I wish this room was full tonight now and, and I hope it, it gets out there but we have to, and I know some of the parents will talk but we have to get our, our youth educated we have to get sports teams educated we have to get coaches educated when these when, when we're putting kids on football fields and, and contact sports and because they want to you know, you know they can get a, a pill to make themselves feel better what do we think they're doing during finals um, it's final season at college right now. These pill presses the sheriff talked about. Uh, look up Livonia. Uh, I think it was last week or two weeks ago in Livonia. Uh, and I, I don't know if uh, or Orville will be able to talk about it or not, but the amount of fentanyl that they seized is, is absolutely scary and the number of people that can kill uh, is, is something that is a major problem. And again, I thank the sheriff for inviting us out and the partnerships that he's created and helped create over, over Oakland County. But we sh our, our community should be concerned about the cost of these drugs that are entering the streets today. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Orville Green. I'm the uh, special agent in charge of the DEA Detroit uh, field office. And um, uh, we cover Michigan, Ohio, and uh, northern Kentucky. So um, there's some numbers, actually, I'd like to share with you. So the, the sheriff mentioned our One Pill Can Kill campaign. So last year, um, we had an enforcement component of our One Pill Can Kill. And nationwide, we seized uh, DEA, along with our, our other law enforcement partners, 79.5 million fentanyl-laced fake pills, nearly 12,000 pounds of fentanyl powder. Um, that's equivalent to, and we, we sort of um, quantify that in deadly doses, 376.7 million lethal doses of fentanyl. So when the sheriff says, you know, we can't arrest our way out of this um, situation we find ourselves in, it is very real. Looking at those numbers, um, uh, events such as this, town halls, um, speaking about educating, um, educating our communities, it's extremely important because that has now become an integral part of, of this fight that we find ourselves in. Um, you know, for, for us, DEA, Enforcement has always been our priority, continues to be our priority, but it's, it's, not, it's no longer our only priority. Uh, we host uh, family summits, which I've met many of the people in this room and developed some really great uh, relationships. And, you know, I am now uh, 
finding work for them to do, not so much for me to do, but I'm, I'm giving them work um, simply by making introductions to people who, who I know need their re resources or could use their uh, resources. Um, you know, um, educating uh, our, 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 the folks we, we um, are uh, paid to support the folks we are we are we are uh, supposed to be responsible for is it's it's a, an important part of, of, of what we do. I, I'd also like to mention on April 27th there's our DEA uh, National Prescription Pill Take Back Day. You know that's a great way to just get rid of unwanted uh, medicines out of, out of your cabinets. Uh, that is in fact one of the ways that many people. Um, start to abuse opioids you know we take it for granted you know my my wife had you know my wife was sick for for a while and uh, a few years ago on take back day i cleaned out our medicine cabinet and you know i think i did the math she had about 60 grand worth of uh, street value of oxy in our in our cupboards you know and you start doing the math but then you think you know Someone also breaks into your house. They know exactly what they're looking for. They know exactly where they're going. But more importantly, you know, that's um, pills that are available for our kids to experiment with, for their friends to experiment with. And um, that's why our, our prescription pill take back um, is also an important part of, of what we do. Uh, I'm not going to take up too much more time because I actually I, I like hearing from you. I want to hear from you. And hopefully I'll be able to answer your questions. Thank you, Sheriff. You know, Sheriff, real quick, and, and Steve, I don't know if you can say it. Yeah, but I, and maybe one of our fa uh, fentanyl fathers can talk about it, but I don't remember what the stat was, but it, I think it's a plane crash a day is what takes somebody away. Um, and if, can you imagine the national news if we had a plane crash every day with the number of overdoses in this country, uh, what news that would make? Um, it's, it, it's, a, it's about 300 people per day um, to drug poisons. Um, yeah, which, which gets us to our number of over 100 uh, plus thousand annually. Um, you know, uh, Chief Gallagher mentioned um, cocaine, and I think that's something that we sometimes overlook because we're so laser focused on, um, on fentanyl. And we were laser focused on fentanyl for a very long time and took our eye off the ball relative to, uh, to cocaine. And so our, and for other reasons in, in, in uh, some of these, um, cocaine uh, producing countries, you know, we took our off the ball and now we're inundated with, with cocaine. You know, um, a kilo of cocaine now on the street in, in Detroit anyway, it's anywhere from 14,500 a kilo or less. And that I think, you know, that's a, that's a big number. That's a very small number. In 2003, when I first started with DEA, a kilo of cocaine was um, in the low to mid 20,000s for a kilo. You know, so what does that mean for us? It means there's more cocaine on the street, as the chief said. There, uh, uh, quite often we see it, we find it cut with fentanyl. And people out seeking cocaine aren't looking for fentanyl, do not have a tolerance of fentanyl. And as we saw, um, it was last year in, in Gross Point and also in, in Kalamazoo, you know, when we have these uh, poisonings, you know, they're mass events. You're talking about three or five people at a time. Kalamazoo, I think we had 12. And, you know, I think five or six of them passed away. So it's, that's why it's important that, you know, we not take our eye off the ball. We focus on these things and, and realize that, you know, yeah, we're not talking about fentanyl. We're talking about cocaine, but it's also it's all one and the same. It's, it's bad enough that, as, as the sheriff mentioned earlier, with, with the stats he gave out uh, for the 2024 20, statistics, the, they, they, the medical examiner's office actually breaks it down. 78 uh, with toxicology results were available to date, uh, 56 fentanyl um, total people, 33 cocaine present, and then it's broken down 25 cases with both fentanyl and cocaine present. And that's just one drug we're naming. We could name other drugs that it's mixed with, but that's the, the prevalence right now, today, is, is with cocaine. You would have talked 10 years ago, you're looking at probably cutting it with heroin. Chief, I just want to take a page out of your book. <clears throat> this half of the room, everyone in the comfy chairs, is the equivalent of the amount of people we're gonna lose nationally in the matter of one hour. The drug seizure you were talking about in Novi was enough fentanyl to kill every single person in the state of Michigan twice. One seizure two weeks ago. So um, with that, I think 
we'll kick it to some of our resident experts that are in the room too. I know we've got uh, Rebecca here. We've got fentanyl fathers here. Um, so, you know, there's no particular order. I mean, feel free to come up. There's a mic there. Please uh, utilize the mic. And that, as the chief said, that doesn't even get into all the other things that are evolving that are being found in the drugs we're testing in my crime lab. There's a, a drug that isn't even illegal right now in Michigan or in the country. And it has a degrading effect on the body when they use it to cut as a cutting agent. And it basically, your skin begins to fall apart and sores begin to appear and it can permanently uh, infect and destroy parts of your body. So we're trying to have some action on that because right now you can, uh, I'm not gonna name it out there so people begin trying to order it, but you can actually still order it and have it shipped here legally and uh, it's destroying people. And that's, again, you have no idea what you're getting when you get something on the street and what's in it. So, Rebecca. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name's Rebecca Kiesling and these are my sons, oh, Caleb and Kyler Kiesling. They were 18 and 20 years old. Um, when they died from fentanyl poisoning, fake Percocets, July 29th of 2020. Um, I just want to share the ways in which it was, you know, a perfect storm and the ways they fell through the cracks and maybe how you may be able to help even more than what you're doing now. Um, first of all, my son Caleb told me that, well, I, I know that their addiction began with vape in middle school. And I was the parent who did everything I could to shut it down, going to the school, showing, you know, on Snapchat and on Instagram messages who's dealing it, who's selling it, you know, let's, let's close this down. And, um, you know, went in their rooms, found stuff. And I remember when I found marijuana in, in high school, um, my son said that he was a mule, and I went to the sheriff, uh, deputy at the school, and he said, don't bring it in here, or I'll have to make a rest. And I, I begged for services. What can you do? How can you help? And over the, throughout high school, the only thing that was offered was to um, take them to the jail for the Scared Straight program. And we did that twice, and there were no other services offered. Nothing. I begged for it. Um, one of my sons had an IEP, so, you know, he had ADHD. They really, really pushed to get him on um, medication for that, and we succumbed in middle school. And now you look at the stats of how many kids that are taking ADHD medicine later become addicted and die, and it's, it's really disproportionate. So that's an issue. Um, then uh, I found out, you know, after they died, there was a girl who spoke with us at Stony Creek High School. We spoke at, uh, with Fentanyl Fathers. We spoke at all three area schools in Rochester. And this girl lost, like, 24 friends. And 14 were in the school district. Like, we never heard that. Like, it was never in the news. There was another kid who died the same day as my son's, and it wasn't in the news because it wasn't sensational, um, but because it was two brothers and there was also a 17-year-old girl from the school district, it was all over the news. But we never hear about it. Our community doesn't hear about all of these deaths, and I think it's critical that this gets reported and that we hear these stories um, because the parents are shocked that it, it even happens at all, and yet at the funeral home, they're telling me how often they see it. Like, we never hear about this. It's, you know, Rochester is supposed to be one of the best communities in the nation. You know, it was Rochester, Rochester Hills was ranked, you know, in the top 10 cities live in America by Money Magazines. And it's, you know, top five schools in the state, like Adams High School where they went. But you, you don't hear about these problems. Um, and so I'm, I'm speaking out. I'm doing my part. Uh, the other thing is when they got in trouble, there was a detective in Rochester who told me that my son said that he um, had been on Xanax 
well, I have a f- another family member who takes Xanax. Like, you don't die from Xanax. Like, I could see, obviously, it's destructive <laughs> to his life, but I didn't think you're going to die. I never heard of fentanyl. Like, I-, I didn't know what that was. And he told me it started in ninth grade from unlocked medicine cabinets kids brought it to school. And that's where their addiction started with, with pills. Um, he didn't tell me later and about all that history until much later. Um, but after they died, several months later, this detective called to wish me condolences, and I asked him, did you know that Xanax on the streets is, is not real Xanax? He's like, yeah. And I said, did you know about fentanyl? Yeah. Did you know about Narcan? Yeah. I'm like, why didn't you tell me? I spent an hour with you. I made you a law enforcement face mask during COVID. Like, we had a relationship. I talked to you. I cooperated. I, I, you know, I was a parent who wanted accountability for my sons. And um, he's like, I didn't think of it. Like, that can't happen. There have to be resources. And it's not just for the people who end up, you know, getting Narcan. It's the family members need to know. And I think that, you know, on the website, I know the DEA said they have everything you need on their website. All it takes is a link to it on every school district should have it. Every law enforcement agency should have it. And you should have a card because my former law partner, I'm an attorney, um, she, her husband is a sheriff deputy. He's a detective in, in Lake Orion, Steve Meach. And he told me that whenever there's like, um, identity theft, there's a whole pa- packet that people get from the county. Everything you need to know to put your identity back together. But there, there was nothing, I don't know if there is now, but there was nothing for family members. You know, you could at least give us a card to a link to a website for the resources that we would need. Um, okay, and then the other thing that Steve Meach told me after my sons died, which was really disturbing, is first of all, he said that um, you know, there's, he's like, I got a stack of these bodies on my desk, meaning like cases of people who died from fentanyl poisoning. And he said that you all don't have, you only have a limited number of people who know how to crack phones to be able to go after these guys. And in our case, again, it was high profile and actually the drug dealer was there and he got saved by Narcan. Um, he had overdosed a month before, and his girlfriend had a couple months before, and he's serving 8 to 15 years for killing three people. Um, but, you know, he confessed initially, so there were leads in our case. But nobody was going to crack the phones unless there was, like, that lead. Um, and then another issue is Steve told me, oh, yeah, well, this is what happens is as soon as people hear about a fentanyl death, um, you know, all the drug users go for it. And, you know, and he was basically, I felt like he was insinuating that my sons asked for it. My sons wrote, you know, how they wanted to be free before they, shortly before they died. They had both gone to jail and Oakland County Jail. Um, and Caleb wanted to speak in schools. And he wrote that he never took meth heroin because he's like i because i didn't want to die and he said i saw how my birth mother's friends were all dying she lost so many friends because he's like i know how dangerous those substances are like he thought he was safe taking pills you know and i and so <clears throat> i really resented the fact that there was someone in law enforcement who was suggesting that everybody wants it they're all asking for it. They're seeking out somebody who's going to have, you know, pills with fentanyl in it. I am absolutely certain my sons did not know that they were taking anything that was deadly. Um, my son, Caleb, I begged. Uh, I begged, first of all, not to reduce his bond. It was 8500 They said they wanted to stay there. They didn't want to do probation. They were clean. They were actually thriving in jail. My son was doing Celebrate Recovery, and they're writing, you know, things, and they're just, they were thriving. And then this Michigan Liberation started bailing them out and said, well, if we can re- get the bond reduced to $1,500, we will bail them each out. I'm like, please don't. They're, they're okay. Just let them be. They're safe. 
I just wanted them to be safe. And, um, and I knew, you know, that, that they could, I didn't know they would die, but I thought they could get behind the wheel or something, you know? And um, Michigan Liberation went ahead and, and bailed them out. The judge redu reduced the bond. And then I said, well, they, they need rehab. Well, Kyler didn't get rehab, he got tether. And within hours after getting off tether, they both died. There was nothing for him once he got off tether. Um, and then my son Caleb got sent to rehab, but it wasn't real rehab. It was a flop house, okay? It was one of those places in Pontiac. Caleb said the only thing that resembled rehab was that they had support group time where you don't have to participate, but you have to sit there. He said they would go for walks in Pontiac in the drug-infested neighborhood every day, and the other people there with him bought drugs while they were out. Okay, that was the rehab that was paid for by, by county, state, and federal dollars. Like, we got to make sure we're watching where our money's going so they can get real rehab and real help. And I'm glad to hear that there's help now, you know, in the jail, like, for, for helping to deal with the, the substance use. But um, I don't know if this is still happening with these flap houses, but that's not real rehab. And it shouldn't be called rehab, and they shouldn't be getting the tax dollars for rehab. Um, the medical examiner. He found cause of death. He, you know, there was fentanyl in their system, and it, five times the amount enough to kill Kyler. He had manner of death undeterminable, which I think is correct, because it's either going to be suicide, homicide, or accidental, or undeterminable. And merely by toxicology, they can't tell. If it was a stab wound, they could make a de determination, but not by toxicology. Sadly, there's other counties where they put accidental. Or, so you can't even have a homicide case. How are you going to do an arrest? Or they'll, put, or they'll put suicide. And they won't even do that right. But our medical examiner put for cause of death, instead of fentanyl toxicity like they do all over the country and many other counties, he put drug abuse. Which is not a scientific finding. It's a... It's a judgment. And, you know, there's, there's toddlers who are dying. You're going to put drug abuse? And he, I called him, and he told me in every case, he puts drug abuse. And then he, he said to me, well, who are you to say I've been doing this for 40 years? And, and, and then he said to me, oh, you want me to sugarcoat it for you? Your sons wouldn't have died if they weren't abusing drugs. And he said, it's just a waste of life. I'm sick of seeing all these kids in here every day. And I, I get that. But there is no way that it should be lawful. We need to have uniformity in our state. It should not be lawful to have a finding cause of death as drug abuse. And how the hell are you going to get a conviction? You know, they had to give this guy a plea deal. How are you going to get a conviction? When they say, oh, well, you know, the medical examiner says they died of drug abuse. Um, so. Th those are the problems that um, I'm laying out there. There's one more, and that is um, I did court-appointed work as, as an attorney in mental health cases and adult guardianships and as a guardian ad litem and as a court-appointed attorney. And I knew that there was a statute for um, involuntary commitment uh, for someone like me to you know, petition to have somebody committed. And nurses can do it, social workers can do it. You know, if someone's dangerous to self or others or unable to care for basic needs due to mental illness. And there's an exception that drug, that substance use disorder does not apply for the statute. And I knew that. And so I thought that we had no option to have him committed, to have either of them committed. But then I find out after they died that Michigan had a new statute that was passed a few years earlier. And parents, there's only a limited number who could petition, and police officers can, um, for substance use disorder. But unlike mental health, you have to commit to 100% of the costs of their hospitalization. 
My son had been hospitalized once for th two nights, and he ended up leaving there with huge debt from that one hospitalization. Like, with everything we'd already been through, with you know everything that goes along with someone having substance use disorder in your family, we didn't have those funds to be able to commit, even if I knew about the statute. I feel like that needs to change. People are dying. It absolutely needs to change. And, you know, we know that substance use can lead to mental illness and, um, you know, high levels of dopamine are associated with schizophrenia and everything. And it's like, well, why don't we get it, take care of it ahead of time before they get to that point? And so those are the laws that I think that needs to be changed and some of the policies that I think need to be changed. Thank you. Um, Maybe if we do this in the future, we should have some lawmakers uh, here. Yeah. It's like, you know, oh, you have to contact your local one. Yeah, well, if, if we have a panel or something like that, we can invite them and we can shame them. Um, but, you know, on, the, on some of the points, you know, um, I know that we train and we have resources at the sheriff's office, and we certainly don't imply nor believe that people are looking for fentanyl out there, especially those that have perished from it, because a lot of them, they're completely unaware it's in what they're taking. So, you know, sometimes there may be a disconnect and, and uh, of that, but I can tell you that our focus has been how do we help people, how do we get them to resources, how do we find them resources, and, and one of them is our rides to recovery. If you show up, we'll take you there. And um, so, you know, Everything, as Chief Gallagher said, it's an evolution. And I think law enforcement has come, at least in Oakland County, very much to the side as how can we help, um, you know, over the course of our career. Anybody have any no, comments on that? Crisis response unit, I think that's, um, uh, what's it, a year now-ish? A little more? Three yeah, so um, the Sheriff's Office created the crisis response unit and, and that is the main focus now, right? Is if, and it doesn't matter what jurisdiction, I can tell you they've been in Bloomfield Township and personally have helped out people we know in our law enforcement on a friend to friend level with nothing to do with our careers where we've referred people to them as well. And, um, you, you know, from what I've seen, they have the right people on the team um, as they, they're one empathetic. Um, there's a difference between if you can try to understand while somebody's in the shoes rather than acting like you've been in their shoes. Um, and, and that's a, that's a, pretty big deal in law enforcement side, right? And so they go to residences and try to knock on those doors um, multiple times. And in a case I can tell you, they, they were a friend, at a friend of mine's at minimum of three times dealing with their family and providing the resources, not only for the person, right? But for the family members involved with that. So the evolution behind that comes, comes with it. And we in Oakland County are very unique, in my opinion, um, in the short time I've been a chief, only a couple years, is to recognize the partnerships that we have. That I know that if I have an issue at 2 o'clock in the morning, I can pick up um, my phone and either, one, call our co-responders, or two, I can call one of the co uh, crisis response units and they're going to be at the door. Um, I've, I've received phone calls from, from Steve on a weekend and apologizing that he's asking me a question on a case we had because um, they're trying to make contact with a family to get somebody into treatment like now. So I think th those things are just important. To, to, unfortunately, we, we, we learn um, from tragedy. Um, and hopefully, that, but to have the funding to be able to do it is a whole other process. I'd like to just make a general statement because I feel it necessary to just state maybe some things that people don't know. And, and I'm saying this because I come from this place. And I felt it very necessary to talk a little bit about our incredible people at the medical examiner's office. And I know that there were some experiences that weren't great. I know Cass Myrka's heart in this work and uh, when Chief was reading through, I know the work and effort Oakland County, despite the failures, are putting in. And I also know um, their dedication to ending the suffering that people are feeling as a result of this. Um, I did not know that recently. It's, it's very new to me because I thought I knew what people were supposed to be doing or what they were doing. And the truth is that I didn't know because I never sat in a room 
to, to feel their, their heart and understand why they're in the work that they're in. Um, so I felt it necessary just to talk about that because the labor that our epidemiologists like Lauren Fink uh, and our medical examiner like Cass uh, put in to minimizing uh, future fatalities for this county is incredible. Um, and it's, it's privileged to work next to them and, and with them. And um, if I can do anything to inspire conversations uh, to move towards a place of healing, um, I wanna create that space. And I would like to just be able to say thank you very much for sharing your story. Mm -hmm. It takes so much courage for you to stand up and share what you've experienced to elicit change. Our entire system, and not just prevention, treatment, and recovery, I mean entire system in terms of policies to how we interact with everyone across the board from schools, nothing is perfect. It is your story, other people who bring their stories forward, that we can make meaningful change. That way, your children's lives, they do mean something, and they will mean something for the future that's created. Hi, my name is Alyssa Batra. Um, I'm a physician and a scientist and psychiatrist. Thank you so much for sharing that, and I'd love to talk with you more afterwards because I really do think that we need to have another one of these with lawmakers present. <laughs> Um, I just did American Foundation for Suicide Prevention um, State Capital Day in Lansing last week, and there are some lawmakers that are so helpful, and there are some that aren't. So what happens when you live in that district where they're not helpful? Are you just out of luck because that's the only person you can vote for? I've seen their eyes glaze over and their ears just shut off when they know that you don't live in their district and you can't vote for them. So I had people tell me, this state senator won't meet with you. She doesn't support anything that American Foundation for Suicide Prevention is trying to get passed. I mean, how is that possible? Are you saying you want people to die by suicide? Like, that's ridiculous. And they'll just stonewall you and they won't meet with you. That shouldn't be allowed. So having them come somewhere like this, making them show up, they get paid really nicely. They get great benefits and they get so many days off per year. They can show up here. They get the summer off, like summer vacation. Um, and you mentioned, Sheriff, that you spent two years trying to get something passed. That is so frustrating. I've done the same of trying to get something passed. I never got it passed. It just died in committee because the people that I vote for weren't the people on that committee. So everyone I emailed on that committee, please discuss this, please take this you know, time to discuss it before it dies, before the end of the legislative year, they didn't care. That was life-saving legislation, just died in committee. So I would love another one of these, and I have ideas for how they should change the laws. I have involuntarily committed many people, sadly. I don't like doing it, but I do it for people's safety. And it can be kind of scary sometimes because some people really don't want to be involuntarily committed, um, but they need it for their safety. And if you look up, you know, what's one of the reasons that people go bankrupt in this country? Medical bills. How can you force someone to have to pay for this, like out of pocket? That's unacceptable. So that's, I'll keep it short so other people can talk. I know there's a lot of people in the room that have a lot of experience and I wanna give them time at the microphone. But yeah, I would love to exchange numbers. I'd love to talk later about some of this. Thank you. And maybe, maybe we can connect some of the email addresses for people that want to be involved in organizing a follow-on. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay, doctor. I'm so sorry. Um, I, I was suggesting that Sandy in the back, we can collect email addresses for people that want to be involved in, in maybe doing a follow-on town hall and have lawmakers present. Yeah. 
Um, my state rep is very helpful, Noah Arbit. I'm sure he'll show up. It's just some people in other districts, and the districts are so goofy, they don't have as helpful of legislators. Yeah, and well, you know, having been in that system, I know if you get the a key person that is willing to take up the torch and they're in a position to move legislation, they can get it done. So what we got to do is get somebody that may be on health policy, maybe a chair or somebody that's willing to come to a meeting, and maybe it doesn't have to be in a town hall, just come to a meeting and get some ideas that will run with those ideas, and then we can hold the town hall to give it a little wind beneath the wings. I, um, many in this room may not know, I've been in law enforcement for 37 years. <laughs> but um, in the middle of that, I was in the Senate for almost a decade. I was the Senate Majority Floor Leader, and I wrote and passed a lot of laws, and the vast majority of them came from my constituents, where they came to me and said, this is a problem, and I was like, I didn't know it. Thanks for telling me. I'm on it. And so if you get the right person in the room, they can take that baton and run with it, and so maybe we can find a path to do that. That can be the, the either the majority leader or the speaker's way to kill a bill. Depends. You know, there's a whole lot of strategy in the committee assignment process, which we could talk about too. Sir, thank you, Sheriff. Uh, my name is Greg Swan. Um, I'm a bereaved dad, uh, and I, with a bunch of other bereaved dads, started a group called Fentanyl Fathers. Um, we've grown. A lot of my heroes are in here tonight. Steve, uh, uh, Sheriff. Um, Chief Gallagher, I, I appreciate what you said. It, it just doesn't take out just the kid. It takes out both parents at the same time. Imagine the impact on that. It's, uh, it's three people once minimally. You got brothers and, every, and sisters and everybody. So it's, it's a real problem, man. You know, no matter how you spin it, whether it's an airplane a day or a classroom a week um, of young people, there's no way to um, hyperbolize how big the problem is and what a 911 it is and how it needs to be jumped on. So I really appreciate Rebecca. I wouldn't be here tonight if she didn't remind me that we have an event tonight. I really appreciate the phone call. And um, I grabbed uh, Rebecca last week. She's a kind of a starlet in the national scene. She's uh, tapped a lot by Fox and uh, um, Newsmax to talk about the border. She had an unforgettable uh, testimony before Congress about um, and because because of her two sons, uh, sadly, and. Um, so we, we drove down to Lansing last week and we stormed the Capitol. We took a picture of it. Uh, the, the guy I was walking in with said, don't, don't ever say that again when you're close to the Capitol. But it was great. We were a, bi a bipartisan group and we got in there and we talked to the minority leader who's a, uh, a Republican and uh, Hall, uh, uh, Senator Hall office and uh, we talked to this guy and he was like all about it he's like oh yeah we definitely could uh, be doing something along the lines of what we proposed which is the fentanyl fathers and mothers act which simply mandates fentanyl awareness in high schools which we we're not really asking we're telling them they have to do this it's done in uh, Florida it's done in where we spent a lot of time we're a national organization it's uh, a mandated in Texas called the Tucker's Law. It's mandated in California called Melanie's Law. And they just mandated in um, Illinois and somebody named it after themselves, some senator did. But we're trying to go with this generic name because most of the states don't have it. But in Michigan, we're going to make it a boilerplate. We have a couple national laws proposed. I don't think those are going anywhere. They literally take an act of Congress to pass and they don't pass. We got Bruce's Law and uh, it, it's been sitting there and been reintroduced by Lisa Murkowski. We, we have other U.S. senators really willing to play ball, at least give lip service. But the two-inch putt is the state law. Um, and we want to mandate it because we get pushbacks from high schools. We've done 100 high school assemblies across the country, and we know what we're doing now. Um, I, I, we've done some with Orville uh, Green, and um, he's been great. We, the, the facts about it are the one pill can kill but we add the emotive movie, the brief parent talking, and we measure it. And of course we do naloxone training. So those elements are necessary in it. But anyways, letting you know, we're gonna see the um, uh, majority leader tomorrow, Tate, and we're gonna let him know. This is how it's gotta be, the state. You gotta mandate 
fentanyl awareness, um, you gotta put, put it to the top of your priority pile because if, unless you have something on your bench killing more kids, this one's it. This is your top priority. And I really appreciate and respect the fact that you're having this at great expense to take your evening out and get all these people, Sheriff, uh, because this is absolutely our number one priority. It's, it, it's killing our kids, it's killing young adults, and the high school level, all the bereaved parents in the country, the last thing I'll say, you know, since 2019, there have been 500,000 deaths. Um, the majority of them are fentanyl from, from, from overdose or poisoning. And that has created over a million bereaved parents. I have not met one that doesn't want to keep their kid's life going by advocating. And kids, you know, can be rude in high school, but when you say, hey, I lost my kid to this, I'm a bereaved parent, they put their cell phones down and they're like, speak, old man, you got my attention. And they're really, really good, good kids. And they'll listen to us and they are crystal clear when we leave and we only have 45 minutes that they, I, I, the way I position it is they, they drink gasoline before they'd have an unprescribed pill. They're not going out of this world this way, that way anymore. And um, we're, we're, we think we're very successful with that and uh, we hope to get a national endorsement from the DEA, Orville. Um, okay. <laughs> I, I presented with one of his uh, uh, agents down in uh, Florida and we think that, um, that we have a, a real system to do that. But if you want to, you know, state senator, you know, people who tell you no, screw these people. We're not, we're not in the mood. We're not impressed with somebody who is complicit with the ignorance of that's, that's killing kids. And ignorance what killed my kid, and it's what killed her kids, because they didn't know what they were taking. And so we're, we're not impressed with that. So we, we want to get this done. We want to get this into schools. Other states are doing it. It's too late to say we don't have a drug problem here. And if you can let your local rep or the state uh, leader Tate or the minority leader Hall know that you think the Fentanyl Fathers and Mothers Act should be put into law sooner than later, we could use your uh, support on that. And uh, if you haven't, if you know school supervisor uh, and you can get into a school, please open it up. We're at fentanylfathers.org. We'd love to come in and. Uh, get those kids thinking real clear about fennel. Thanks for letting me share. Yeah, thanks for being here. And as was mentioned, um, and it's very true, I know from my days as a lawmaker, when someone comes in and opens up their heart about a tragedy they've experienced, you know, people on the committee usually like put down their phone and they tune in because they're hearing a real story. It's not some lobbyist coming in to talk about some abstract policy that they've been hired to come in and talk about. When you've got a parent that lost a kid, if that's not enough to get you to put down your phone, you need to find another job. Plain and simple. If you're not that connected and that empathetic when somebody's talking about how their child died to tune in, you shouldn't be sitting in that chair. I don't care what party you're in. So, you know, thanks for doing what you're doing. It makes a difference, even though sometimes your slog doesn't feel like it. It, it gets people's attention. And please let me know, you know, where you are in that process. I'm happy to help support that act. And, you know, I can loop in the Michigan Sheriff's Association. The one thing about passing legislation, the more you have pile on the the more likely you are to get a little momentum. So if you get the psychiatrists and the Michigan sheriffs and the fentanyl fathers and, and you get fan and you get, you know, moms and you get all of those different groups, you know, pastors, then suddenly you start to get a bit of momentum for legislation. So someone else wish to speak? Sir. How's everybody doing tonight? Uh, just gotta get the microphone to work. My name is Charles Sanders um, from TAC Detroit. So we deal with a lot of meth lab, fentanyl cleanups. And the main thing that I've seen over the time for me doing it is what happens to the kids that's around us. Uh, that should be the main focus that we deal with is really the kids. I see people that sell it, you know, and once we remove, we know that either Maybe it's a couple, maybe it's a person, but what about the kids that come after that? So 
I went to Pontiac Northern before they uh, merged together with Central. And back in 2005, my mother had an overdose with opioids and dealt with this thing. And as I got older, she passed in 2015, and I did the same thing she did. So coming from that aspect and being from the inner city community and Detroit as well, what do we do with these kids that deal with the after effects of having a mother or a father that's hooked on these type of things? That's the most important, you know, because if we don't help with that, and add that valuable resource, those kids become the same thing as the mothers and fathers. So in order to build a better generation, we must start with the kids first, and the adults as well. But the kids are the most valuable asset to the society, and if we make sure that they have awareness, like one of the, fa the fentanyl fathers were saying, that they have the awareness, if they see their parent overdosing, they already have the awareness to know what's going on, you know, and, and put those policies, policies in place that way that it can maybe help create a better community. But I just wanted to share that story to say that I once was the kid, the son, that did the same thing that my mother did, and I was at a psych ward at Providence Hospital because I only did what the trauma that I was used to. I just did the same thing she did. So I just, it hurts me to know that these kids have to go through this but it's just how can we change this and, like you say, implement it in the schools to let them know that they have counselors that can help with this certain situation and we can build a better community like that. Can you share what's involved in the cleanup? So with those cleanups, the meth lab and fentanyls, we try to remediate and get that environment back to safe as possible. Within those, there are, are uh, pills, different type of residue left over, the actual lab itself that is very chemically induced. So we try to remove all of that to get that back to a safe environment. But you know, like I said before, when I'm leaving that, I'm thinking, what if a kid comes after that and they get a piece, just a little bit of that residue or peel or anything that's left? You know, so how can we help create a better environment for these kids that's coming up and the influences, you know? One thing that you touched on, um, you, you know, as law enforcement, we can go into the schools and we can have a conversation with them, but most of the kids are going to look at us like we're lecturing, right? Because we see that, that the aftermath of the problems. It's your story that can go into a building and make a difference. So I had the opportunity uh, and, and went to Rochester Adams. I, Steve had told me about you know, fathers uh, and, the, and Joe, uh, Joe and um, her team from Christ Response. So myself and our community relations officer went and sat at, at Adams High School and listened to them for the first time. And we sat in the back. And so I had no idea what to expect in, in this, in this um, presentation. But I can tell you that, I don't know if it was by chance or if it was planned that way, I still don't know. Watch, it was one of the first things in the morning, but when the students' pictures of the deceased were put on the wall, and all of them, and I believe all three of them, were Adams graduates, all of them wearing either a soccer uniform, a baseball uniform, or some sports uniform, you could watch the shoulders in the room drop from the rear, right? Because, of the store, because now it just hit home. Reality just smacked them in the face that this is real. These are, our, these are kids that are sitting in the same, that should be sitting next to me or telling me the story. And you're a survivor of that in a way, right? Yes, to be able to go and share your story is where you have to partner with us or with people to be able to share a little more in depth of what you experience because we can do it, but we're from a position of authority, right? Mr. Swan going in, you going in and saying, look, we, we just woke up one day thinking today was going to be normal. And, and, and a dose of reality faced us. On top of that, I think it's important to talk about, and maybe Orville, you can touch on it, is the amount of fentanyl it takes to kill you. And so that amount is so small that I'm not sure a high school student or an eighth grade student who says, here, buddy, you want to try this, understands that even just a small, small amount in that pill can take your life. And I, I just, the education aspect behind it, because we don't want to, especially males, right? Our brains develop a lot slower. And that's reality that we're, we're making decisions that are costing us our lives. And the sheriff had the numbers, the majority of probably from the age of 18 to 35, I would say, is, if I had to guess, and I didn't see, it's probably the greatest, you know, the largest number of deaths. It's, um, so there's, it's two milligrams, right? Enough 
powder to fit on the tip of a pencil and not cover the entire pencil. Uh, what we found in our lab analysis from the pills we've seized nationwide, it, uh, a year ago, it was um, six out of 10 year before that, it was four or five. And uh, currently it's seven out of 10 pills contain uh, a, pot a potentially lethal uh, dose of fentanyl, right? So 70% chance of getting, of, of getting a pill that's, that's going to kill you. But I would say to your point, sir, um, I was at the same event at Rochester Hills, the, the Fentanyl Fathers put on, and um, my office is in Detroit, so I sit in Detroit as well, and, you know, and I'm, I'm a part of um, different meetings and, and working groups in Detroit. And we were in, in the meeting, uh, that's, um, it's, it's a, uh, an initiative um, ran by the U.S. Attorney's Office, the U.S. Attorney Don Eisen was there um, hosting a meeting, and we were talking about is this one Detroit is what it's called. And as I'm sitting in this meeting, it occurred to me, again, thinking about the kids, you know, what I saw and what I was a part of a few weeks prior with, the, you know, at the Fentanyl Fathers presentation, you know, I, I said to, um, to uh, one of the ladies from uh, the health department, another lady from Black Family Development, said, hey, you should talk to this guy, Greg Swan, you know, because I think what he does and the resources they have you know, and, and the reality is communities of color are at a deficit, right? That's just the reality. There, there are certain things I think we take for granted and, and um, certain outreach that's just not done. But having the opportunity to sit in this space and then to sit in that space there, you know, I am that conduit. Again, it's not me doing the work, but if I can put these people together and, you know, hats off to Greg, kudos to him, you know, he reached out to these ladies and, and they're working on bringing the resources from Fentanyl Fathers to those schools, to those communities in, in Detroit. So again, it, I may not be doing the work, but I might introduce you to someone to do some work. You know, and, and that, I think that is just as helpful. It's just as important. Yes, sir. Also <clears throat> you know, I think the thing that touched me the most is, you know, you're sharing your personal experience of being able to see the results of some of the things that happened in your family dynamic, same for me. Um, and despite that, um, those things also happened to me directly. Um, and I think what that speaks to is that we can witness these things, but without the proper education and tools, um, prevention organizations, um, coalition support that actually go and educate and give tools for healthy coping mechanisms, it's unavoidable. And so there's a responsibility to educate and provide tools uh, that better serve and also identify that need for service in our communities. And there is a need for services in that family dynamic and for the children um, in those environments uh, that we are currently looking at, thanks to some of this data. Um, we have identified areas that we do not have services that can support those, and we've reached out to organizations in Wayne County or Macomb County, such as Families Against Narcotics or DWIN, um, to partner where we, we don't have that yet so that we can learn from their successful programs and hopefully be able to implement them in our communities. So one of the things that I was kind of worried about when we started looking at this is, is really taking this on as these big failures, like we're not celebrating the success of moving forward, but taking these failures and looking at them in a different way, reframing them as a way to just be transparent and say, hey, look, here it is, and we have an opportunity to, to change that generational trauma um, and move together as a collaborative partnership. And I, I can speak for the people that I know that have been able to do that. Um, and. I think all of us as stakeholders are championing those efforts and holding each other accountable to speak those truths and, and hear from our community what we need to do to better fulfill the obligations to, um, to our neighbors, to the people we love. Hi, um, 
I'm Lisa Daniels Goldman, and I am co-founder of the Jamie Daniels Foundation. Um, my heart just breaks for you um, because I've been there. Um, we lost Jamie in 2016. <clears throat> what I, in listening, you know, to things that are being said today, and services that we have. So I made a couple of notes, and they're not exactly in order. Um, but talking about going into schools and telling your stories, I agree. It is really, really important. And we have actually spoken to different school districts about making it mandatory that when your kids have to go for orientation, you make it mandatory that a parent or guardian go with that child and sign a form and listen to somebody get up and speak on drug use throughout the year, you know, so that their kids know. So, and I think that, you know, especially with the, um, the Alliance of Coalitions, their community um, coalitions that go into the schools, they have great access there. And I know certain programs that go into the school, but if the police departments in those school districts get behind that, I know um, I'm in West Bloomfield, I know that I've sat at, we've sat at um, township meetings, and the, the school superintendents are involved. If, if the police department gets involved and says, this is really important and you should make it mandatory, they may listen more than a bereaved mom coming in. And you know, with, with all due respect to my, my bereaved parents, it may have more impact for them, for the principals to implement something in the year so that every kid hears from the younger grades on. I mean, we have prevention programs now. We're starting in kindergarten. So in, you know, in some of the Oakland County districts, we're in West Bloomfield, in Berkeley, in Oak Park, where we have prevention and it's mindfulness and coping through yoga. We're teaching the young ones how to cope with stresses that eventually as they get older and go into middle school and high school, that hopefully they won't turn to drugs and alcohol as a coping mechanism. So that's one of the, you know, the ideas that was, was mentioned. Um, I would also say that when you talked about the sober home or the flop house that your sons went to, which unfortunately, um, Jamie was in treatment, he was sent down to Florida, he was in inpatient treatment, and in his step-down programs was patient brokered into a sober living home. And while he was in uh, recovery for seven months, he was manipulated by treatment centers, doctors, and they were paid to get him on medication again, and our insurance you know, was fraud fraudulently charged. So while Jamie's death was written as an accidental overdose, we were still able to We've gotten one of the doctors who's now serving a prison sentence, certainly not long enough, um, but they are going after them, regardless of what's written on that death certificate. Um, but that being said, um, we had no resources here. And so my question now would be, how do parents, and I know you can go to your pediatrician, you can go to your doctors, but they don't know. They don't have all the information. You know, Jamie died in 2016. We only dealt with his addiction for a year and a half to two years. When he was what we thought at his lowest point, my husband, who's a doctor, a Beaumont doctor, went to Beaumont and said, you know, my stepson is in distress. What do we do? And it was, I don't know. They they didn't have anything. So I went on the computer, and what do you see? You see beautiful seaside properties of, of you know, uh, treatment centers. And I was afraid to phone. So I think we're missing a direct correlation from you know, OCHN, give us, we need points. You know, this is the one disease that you're thrown in in the middle of it. You don't get stage one, stage two. You get zero to 60, you're in, and now we're spinning out of control, and we don't know what to do. And we don't know the first person to talk to, who do you call? And that's a problem. So somehow, how do you address that? Um, so there's a question. How, do you, how would you address that to parents who don't know where to turn? They don't know that alliance exists. They don't know OCHN right away. 
How do, you, how do they get those resources? And finally, my only last point about the sober living home is that what I was told was they were designated under uh, Persons with Disabilities Act, these homes, so that anyone could purchase a home and turn it into a sober, call it a sober living home and just charge. And that is ongoing across our country. And I, I've seen it, I know it. Um, I know many that are going to jail for, prison for it, but they happen all the time. So it is, it, it is the biggest money maker. And unfortunately, you know, substance use disorder, I say if you wanna make a lot of money, get into that business because that's what it is and we don't know how to clean it up and no one's willing to step forward and clean it up and make it you know safe for our loved ones to get help thank you thank you so much for your comments and what you bring up um, is what we the challenges that we face every day um, we are always looking at how can we reach the public more for people who know who OCHN is for people who have Medicaid they know who they're supposed to call and part of what I think the public doesn't understand at times is we're the public safety net so even if you don't have Medicaid, we will help you find the answers. And so that's part of what we are always strategically trying to look at and say, where do we need to be? Where do we need to embed staff into to try to help um, get the message out more and be a better resource for the community? And so one of the things um, in the past couple of years, especially to that point where what I'm hearing everyone discuss a lot is with the schools, and um, it all really starts with whether it's programming or in the schools. That's really one of the first places that a lot of people are gonna turn to. Um, and so what we started doing was embedding um, school health navigators um, around the community into specific schools, so that way when families have questions and say, where am I to turn, we have those uh, navigators who are embedded in the schools. Um, unfortunately, with the amount of schools that we have in the county, we can't embed you know, navigators into um, every single school. Um, but that is something that we are constantly trying to strategically look at. Um, one of the things that we have done recently in this past year through COVID funding through the federal government, we really have spent the time and effort in redoing a lot of our educational campaign material, um, doing commercials that go out to the general public. I spend a lot of time um, talking with our communications department, our team. We create focus groups um, for people who are served, uh, for community stakeholders, for our treatment and prevention providers to say, how is it um, that people are hearing messages nowadays? Because, I mean, I'm not that old myself, but it's different. I'm 42, three, um, but this, <laughs> I'm, something like that. But the, the way in which messages reach people, you know, I mean, I graduated from high school in 2000. It, you he, would watch TV, you would see commercials, and then uh, you would listen to the radio and hear those commercials, right? Um, the internet started coming around, you know, a couple of years before I graduated. Um, but now there's Spotify. There, like, there are so many other platforms that people just listening to the radio, that's not the way they hear about things anymore. Um, I'm constantly always asking the question, how are we getting this message out to the public who doesn't know about us? Because that is who we have to touch more. That is who we have to help try to understand and teach them. There is help available, even if it's something we can't help with directly with our services, we are gonna help get you in that direction. You will never walk away from us with us saying, sorry, you know, we can't help you. Um, even if your insurance is a private insurance, we're gonna help, we're gonna drill down and say what services are covered, what are your costs, um, so that way we can help identify with you as something affordable or not affordable. And so I think it's, it's a challenge we face. Oakland County is a very large county um, that we're always trying to look at how can we get the word out. And to me, until 
every single person in the county knows and understands what services are out there through OCHN and how we can help you even if you don't qualify for our services, then our work is never done. Um, I think that's something that's always going to be ongoing and we look for those new avenues for how can we try to touch more people. I'd love to share some good news with you. The good news is um, there's a new, there's a change happening. And the change is we need unconventional methods to attack this issue. Unconventionally, you would not pick up the phone to call law enforcement to seek help for someone who was struggling. That's changing. Um, Chief Gallagher, you know, the OG here of the co-responder model. Um, we think we pick up the phone to call a doctor when our, when our children or our family are suffering. But we don't think to reach out to law enforcement that now have partnerships in our communities that have vetted out these stakeholders and been able to make those connections so that those, those offerings are available. Um, and that is the biggest change right now between the co-responder model, um, the OFR, um, and other things that are happening. And so, you know, I, I, I get often accused of becoming a sellout uh, because I've got this beautiful new relationship with law enforcement. But what I know now is it's necessary because they've gone through all the things. Um, they're also out there in the field. They're dealing with this. They have crisis teams that are embedded. They know how to deal with these things. And, and so I think that that's a resource that now is coming available, more available, because of the incredible work from Oakland Community and um, some of the chiefs. I also want to identify the housing issue. We are very well aware, because of these reviews, of the particular houses that are problematic. And so what we've done um, in help with the, the crisis response unit is we've gone to city officials, we've gone to the zoning, and we've given them the real data of calls for service. We had an incident where 76 calls for service at one address, four overdoses in a matter of 15 days, four fatalities in three months, and it was out of control. And so we bring these to them. One of our biggest conflicts is how do we how do, we, how do we provide safe housing for people in these situations? Because there's a moral conflict there. So we can bring our city partners together to make them aware and bring services to those areas so that we can bribe, provide them to the community without condemning properties and hold these um, owners accountable that live in California and buy property in Pontiac. And so that is what's happening now. Um, as a result of these conversations, as a result of these systematic failures that we've been able to identify. So, uh, you know, that is, that is happening now. Um, and and our, our job, uh, at least my promise, is to let more people know what's happening because these are new, very, very new, innovative things that have happened within the last four to five months. Some long-term co-responder, um, but that insertion of substance use along with mental health um, make it make it uh, a little different than it was a year ago. Yeah, and that it brings up a great point because yeah. it really oh. highlights the need of what we're doing here today and what we all continue to try to do together. It's we have those community partnerships with each other because that's ultimately what's going to help spread the word to everyone and let everyone know um, what is available out there to them because those are the key pieces there's so many there are so many pieces of information that come from so many different sectors um, you look at you know like you, what you were saying with the co-responder unit we have um, OCHN staff that is embedded at the prosecutor's office um, that is able to do screening brief intervention um, sc uh, screenings right off the bat to see if they can um, uh, divert from the justice system. So it's really identifying key partners, stakeholders, that we're able to say, how are people getting touched um, in a way that's not coming through maybe OCHN, not coming through the front door, but they're coming through law enforcement, they're coming through the court system, they're coming through doctor's offices, um, they're coming through the hospitals. Um, having uh, peers embedded in the hospital system using the Project Assert model, that's huge because it's 
helping the uh, hospital system be able to navigate the behavioral health system, you know, and bridging that gap. And so finding all of those key places where people are getting touched along the way and embedding the staff in there who are the experts to say, we know what can be done. Let us help build this partnership and we can help these families navigate the system. Yeah, and just real quick, I feel like you sat in one of our roll calls um, because any law enforcement officer in here will tell you we ran, we, we, had, we share the same concerns. Our officers put on many different hats. Um, on a daily basis, I wish legislators would come and ride with law officers or, or police departments or actually go online and see that all our policies are already out there, right? But they say, we'll sit around roll call tables or, or at lunch with, with a whole shift of people and we'll have the same conversation. We did nothing for that family. Or God, we, we wish we could have done more for that family. And so I think that comes back into why this co-responder model of the crisis response unit, are, we're bringing it back because we recognize that shortcoming of our, our people that we are going to these runs. When the people are in the darkest moments, your, your situation, you're calling the police. We could, there was a long time we didn't have OCHN's information or the resources that were truly available for us to provide you. So we left your home and tomorrow we're coming back and the day after we're coming back. And it, it's a, it was that revolving cycle. And so with these units, um, and it, it's such a big deal that the opioid settlement money now um, that, the, that the county received and all our municipalities received and through the lawsuits, it's strictly for um, responding to opioid problems um, and that's really a product of what your crisis response unit is and you know I just wanted to real quick and maybe we're even switching gears is we can focus nationally right we have a job to do that as, a, as an or you know as individuals when we vote and so we focus our time and our energy on the border but the problem is is the border is open and we're here we have to focus on the problem that the border brought and that's keeping the reality is we're facing this problem with opioids with fentanyl with that it's here we have to maintain our focus uh, while we can from from a local level, especially on dealing with the problem that's in front of us. And it's, a, it's our jobs as, as a group is, is to then deal with nationally what we think is the case. But um, we're, it's here and we have to face it, the reality of it. Stop you there, but um, we're talking about services that can be provided to the community. And new services are coming online uh, uh, every month. Uh, there's a new one that people need to be aware of. It's called the, addiction, the Adolescent Addiction Recovery Center. And it's a new facility that's based in Troy in uh, the Children's Hospital there on Big Beaver, that Lego type looking building, which I refer to it as. And this is a facility that's solely focused on helping children 18 and younger who have a substance use disorder. Whatever it might be, whether it's cocaine or marijuana or vaping, um, because we recognize that that was an issue that wasn't being addressed in our community. Uh, this is a nonprofit facility that's a partnership between the Children's, uh, Children's Hospital of Michigan, where the, the facility is housed, with um, University of Pediatricians, which manages the facility, where those, the staff um, are, are employed by, and the Children's Foundation, the Jimmy Daniels Foundation, that provides the philanthropic support to maintain the facility. The great thing about it is it's structured where it's open and available to everybody regardless of your insurance, regardless of your ability to pay. Certainly when you walk in the door, they're gonna check and see if you have insurance. If you don't, that's where that philanthropic support comes in. So make sure that no child gets turned away. That was one of the key elements that was that the director, a gentleman named Dr. Matt Lacasse, wanted to make sure it was an element of this facility. Now Dr. Lacasse is a general psychiatrist, he's an adolescent and and child psychiatrist, and he's a specialist in addiction psychiatry. But when you talk about getting the message out, that's one of the challenges for this, this um, facility. It's only been open for about 18 months now, but it's getting to get some steam because family counselors, school counselors, who, in, who encounter children who are struggling with an addiction that's probably beyond their capability to handle that child and counsel that child properly, now is able to turn that child over to this resource to get the appropriate support they need to overcome those challenges. So I just wanted to make sure people were aware of that, that uh, service here in the community. Yeah, and I, my takeaway from some of these discussions um, that, you know, you have a, a booklet on identity theft. We actually have a booklet on uh, addiction and uh, drugs and what we're seeing in the community. So, <clears throat> but it needs to be updated with some of the new resources. 
and it needs to be more widely distributed. And there's a constant reminder. I mean, the other thing that the chief is not mentioning is our people on the front line are deluged with training on everything under the sun from how to interact with someone on the spectrum, how to interact with an EDP, how to interact with someone who cannot communicate, how to interact with a different culture, how to interact with bloodborne pathogens, how to interact. <laughs> they get such a block of training these days that you know, one of them may not have remembered to have that card. But what we can do is update that educational card, and we can also share with our partners. I know we communicate with every school in Oakland County a couple times a year through the sheriff's office. And one of it's coming up, we call it Operation Graduation, if it hadn't already happened, where I write a letter to every graduating senior encouraging them to make smart choices in this time of year that parties are expected and appropriate, but you know we kind of go into a little bit of life choices that the world is your oyster as long as you you know, make those kind of choices. So maybe what we can do, and I'll ask maybe Sergeant Miller with the training division to get with our experts here to come up with what would be basically a little car that we can push out, not just our deputies, but to every officer in the county. If they get asked a question from parents, where can I get help, that they could hand them a card that has a connectivity to some of the resources and some of the help, and that at least helps begin the educational process. I know you've been sitting there a long time. I, I won't belabor that. Sir, go ahead. Hi, good evening, sir. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Shamsudoha. I'm an addiction medicine physician, and my nurse is Nurse Debbie. She's an addiction nurse. I've been practicing addiction medicine for the last six years in Pontiac. And over the last six years, seven of my patients have died from fentanyl overdose. And in the last one year, six of our patients have died from cocaine overdose. So I have 13 dead patients. So I just want to share with you some uh, points of view. Uh, since I started losing patients with fentanyl overdose, and all my patients are adult patients, they're not children. They're over 50 years of age. Uh, so I try to advise, uh, I do urine drug screen on every patient every day. So I know what they have got in their urine, whether it's heroin, fentanyl, uh, cocaine, morphine, uh, whatever drug they have. So I'm able to tell them that if they have fentanyl, that we can try to treat them. In the first few years, the, most of the patients refused treatment. So, uh, so I was unable to help them. So over the last two, three years, uh, we have developed a method of medical treatment for, hair, for fentanyl positive patients and so they do not die from fentanyl overdose. And uh, I want to share with you one patient who is a sex worker and she has to use uh, drugs, whatever, whatever, whatever the, the customer wants them to use. So she is positive every month for fentanyl, heroin, and uh, cocaine. And I was very worried that she's going to die. So t two years ago, I started her on treatment for for this combination of fentanyl overdose and heroin overdose. And she has been positive every month for all three drugs for two years, and I've kept her alive. So there, so there is a treatment available for fentanyl overdose. And the treatment is something you may be familiar with, Suboxone, but it has to be used in a high dose. If they take it every day, they, you can prevent death from fentanyl. So that's the, that's the good news I want to share with you. Uh, the other is, uh, as I said, six of my patients have died from cocaine overdose in the last one year, and very high levels of cocaine. And as you said earlier, someone mentioned that cocaine has become cheap, it's very available. That must be the reason I couldn't figure out why so many patients were dying from cocaine overdose. I also want to share with you that over the last five years, uh, Nurse Debbie and I have treated cocaine addiction, and we have cured over 40 patients with cocaine addiction. 
So there is good news out there. The treatment for fentanyl overdose, the treatment for cocaine overdose. I just want to share that with you. Thank you. It's a hard act to follow up there. So I'm Josephine. Um, I'm with the Crisis Response Unit. Um, our unit consists of Pepper right here. If you can just raise your hand as we introduce you. She's one of our peer navigators. Kyle Hayes is with the de uh, Sheriff's Department. Paul Shankin is another peer navigator. On the end is Chris Miller, who is our sergeant, and Steve Norris, who is sitting up on the panel. Um, I would feel remiss if I didn't speak to you about what it is that we're doing that looks a little different than what the landscape of um, responding to overdoses looks like. Um, first of all, um, I wanna speak to the preventative and the youth part of that. We've been involved with Fentanyl Fathers. Um, we were invited by Steve actually to sit in with Greg and it happened to be from some questions of the students regarding um, what their liability and what their concern for um, conviction if they call 911. So we have now been embedded in those programs to speak to the children in uniform. We usually have our gun and our badge so they identify that yes, we are law enforcement and yes, we are partnering with uh, the, the peer navigators and uh, the fentanyl fathers and the grieving parents um, to say, um, the Good Samaritan law says you are not going to be charged criminally if you call 911 and you're going to help. But so my point of that is that we quickly, once we got the invitation, we realized that following up on the overdoses, which is we, we respond to co-occurring mental health and substance use. And we found out very quickly that coming in on the substance part of that and then assessing the mental health uh, seemed to be the most effective way to deal with the co-occurring because a lot of the mental health folks are uh, using substance to self-medicate. Um, the use of the substance can also result in mental health complications. So I will tell you that every day, and Kyle is the whiz on it, we vet through every call in Oakland County that we service because we have access to their uh, reports. And what we do different than a lot of the uh, other agencies that are out there and have a, a quick response unit, yes, we follow up on every overdose there is, and there's times we come and we knock on a door, and in that report it didn't say that a loved one had passed. So we are now faced in the eyes of a loved one that have, may have lost um, a, a fiancé, comes to mind in one particular one. Um, and so we're at that point, we're dealing with bereavement and getting those, that family into care. Um, so we follow up on any overdose, whether it's Narcan deployment, we're now using Opvi and, and Pontiac. Uh, but what we do do different is we follow up on simply calls for service. When Kyle runs overdose, alcohol, fentanyl, just by a word, we get to find simply a call for service. So when we speak about getting ahead of this, I don't know that there's something else out there that puts us ahead of the game other than this technique where we get to go and knock on a door before someone has come to the brink of death from an overdose from opioids. Um, a lot of what we deal with is alcohol, but a lot of what we deal with is simply something that says a 27-year-old man overdosing in the, in the intersection of Baldwin and Columbia. And so all we've asked our deputies to do is to put a person's name in that, and then we go with our peer support folks, and, when, and we do two, we try to do only two so it's not overwhelming, but law enforcement is standing side by side with our peer support folks to extend them a hand of help. And I will tell you that probably 50-50% of our calls are calls that we're finding simply by people that are in crisis before they reach the overdose or before they have succumbed to um, the overdose in terms of a death. So that is unique, I think, in what we're doing. Um, and um, when we were speaking about the schools and why, why, why isn't the Fentanyl Father uh, program in the schools, I will tell you, 
Our sheriff is very, very, very proactive. We, um, we were in this unit, uh, it would have been a year this past December, and we had a clean canvas, which made it very, very nice for us because he said, paint it the way you see that it needs to be painted. Um, and so in that, there were a lot of colors on our palette. Um, we provide food baskets, we, we stand side by side with people in court when they're faced with a situation that may have been complicated by substance use or mental health. Um, I'm working with an elderly woman right now that her husband's in a mental health facility, ended up in Wayne County, but started up here in Oakland County uh, because she's fearful to drive down there by herself. So we're gonna, we're gonna make sure that, that that wife gets to her husband in that mental health facility that is also struggling with a heroin addiction. And I will share with you that they are about 65 years old, the two of them. Um, but back to the school, um, Deputy Hawk, who is over the uh, school officer program, um, has seen the program put together um, with Fentanyl Fathers, with Alliance for Narcan Deployment and Education of Fentanyl, and he did go to Oakland County Schools. So we are very proactive in knowing the need to get this into the schools. Um, as of right now, it's, it's, uh, it's not a go, but I would encourage everybody in this room, if you think that this is a valuable program, which again, it's the only thing that we are seeing out there other than the parental involvement and family involvement and friend involvement to encourage these young people to just not do the pills because that is the concern right now for that particular age group. Um, so we're still working on it. I believe Deputy Hawk is still, he hasn't given up the fight, uh, but that is a fight that um, uh, as a sheriff's department, we are encouraging uh, bringing this, the education into the schools. Um, Steve spoke briefly about uh, a particular address that we're dealing with. As soon as it became aware that that was a hot spot, um, as a unit, we did, we went up to City Hall, we knocked on the windows to the building and zoning and safety and said, hey, we got a problem. And we got the ears of not just the person we were speaking with, but the supervisor came over and joined us at the window. And now we are partnered with them. They haven't gotten their license just yet to be a, uh, a rental unit. So um, I'm just trying to highlight a few things for you guys to, to know that we are out there in the fight. When you all spoke about a resource list, I just spoke with Pepper and Paul and Kyle and I, we met with them and we were just speaking to the fact that we need to compile a uh, complete list of what resources are out there. So with that, I just wanna let you know we are trying to be innovative. We are open to any suggestions that you may, uh, may have for us. Um, you can find us Boy, I'm not sure. Let's go through Alliance uh, because we are partnered with them, but we have business cards. We'd love to leave them with y'all. Um, if you know of someone that is in, in a mental health struggle, um, with a substance struggle, uh, please get a hold of us. Like I said, we really are finding a lot of folks before they are in a critical crisis. And uh, so with that, Okay, so my name is Denise Harris. I might be all over the place because, like she said, I'm touching different bases. Um, I am a registered nurse, been a registered nurse for 24 years, worked mainly in Rochester, so I've seen a lot of things that didn't make it to the news and different things like that, where if it was in Pontiac in certain neighborhoods, it probably would have. Um, I also lost my brother to an overdose. I was uh, my niece's guardian for the last five and a half years. Um, her mother is still out there on drugs to this day. Um, in and out of prison. So I've seen it from multiple aspects. I also work part-time at a methadone clinic trying to help people get off of the drugs. I'm also a president of a nonprofit for children who lost a loved one. It started off for children who lost a loved one to violence, but um, it's now more, um, we're seeing more trauma because we know that people that have traumatic experiences, especially kids, will grow up into, like he said, um, following the footsteps of their loved ones and things like that. So I say all of that to say I've seen so many different aspects of it, but just even like we've came so far because last year 
I um, tried to, I, I'm a CPR owner too, so I do CPR training. So like last year, I um, reached out to Steve or to the coalition and was like, I'm trying to be a train the trainer. I've been trying for like a year and a half. I do these CPR classes. There's a small portion of Narcan training in there, but I see so many people. I'd love to do this. I said, at that point in time, there was different people there. Steve was like, oh, come on in, we'll get you trained. From there, me and Steve have been going, going kind of strong, like to the point where when we did get those boxes, um, the Save a Life stations, I was the second place to get one. I've called Steve probably 20 times, called the Alliance, called Stacy, whoever. I have another one, I have another one. Um, I do have contacts to city council, to the state rep, to whatever, but then also to the aspect of getting in the school district, it's not that easy. I'm, I've, I've tried so hard, which, thank God, I just made contact after being the prevention coordinator for Pontiac, and not daily, but le weekly trying to get into the school district. I got in there by Anthony Graputo is gonna be doing his magic show, so that's kinda how I got in there. I'm not gonna say that's the only reason, but talking about vaping never really got me there. So I mean, I've been trying hard, so I'm like a one-man band doing my own thing. So how can we all get our resources together? You guys don't know who I am, but I know damn well, he follows me. I, I will go to a bus stop, I will go to church, I will go to a youth group, I'll be at a business meeting, I will be doing Narcan training. Any and everywhere I go, I have to call and pick up 100 boxes at a time because wherever I go, I'm gonna give you Narcan training. If it's in my trunk, I did a CPR training the other day and I was like, oh, you know what? They were waiting for somebody else to come. I was doing an in-home daycare and she said, oh, I work at a bar and that would've been nice. I said, you know what, since you're waiting for your daughter to come, I turned around, went back to my office, got six boxes in Arcan and took them to her because she works at a bar. So I know what I do, but how, how can we all do that together? Like, I, w I don't know about the dad thing. I'm just learning about that. I do know about fans. I do know a lot about the Alliance, but how do we get that network going? Is there an email list we put together? And then like, it's great we're meeting today and it's great we got these boxes out here and it's great that we got to the point where Narcan is now accessible and things like that, but do we have like, you know, we have the task force for the, for them actually overdosing, but do we have a task force for the community? I know we have the coalition for mainly the teens and things like that, but what about moving forward? Do we have a call to action to move forward? Um, even something as small as drug take that back, <laughs> drug take back day, I've called and called and called to try to um, link up with Oakland County for the Pontiac substation and haven't got a call back. One day I called Steve like, hey Steve, I know you're uh, cool with them up there. He's like, oh, I'm actually up here right now. I was like, I'm trying to do drug take back day as part of Pontiac Prevention and the Coalition. He gave somebody my number, I haven't heard from them. So, I mean, I'm just saying, I'm at a loss, but I also have connects in certain places, but it's still like, what's our call to action? in the community. Yeah, so um, obviously we've got a couple of folks here that are in the sheriff's office. Um, also, Pontiac has a community outreach team um, that is deputies in Pontiac, and we also right. have... Right, I stopped by and I talked to them, and one of them was on vacation, and um, the other one was out of town, and then I talked to the Hispanic guy, and he was going to put it to his supervisor, and then nobody called me back, and then I called... Oakland County and got the runaround. Actually, when we were, I was here when you did your um, state of the dress for the 100th box in Arcan. So I, um, I asked somebody else after that, no call back. Then I called Steve, like, hey, I'm trying to get the, just, just because I know that I am out in the community to the point where I've had people call me through Facebook that don't know my number, but no, Denise, Denise has the Narcan. Denise, do you know she can do it? So so and so is overdosing. Don't call me. Call 911. But this is what you do. Or so and so swallowed drugs. Um, what do I do? You know, like I get all types of calls from all different levels. So it's like I I've tried to reach out there. So I am from the Pon the Pontiac Prevention, and there's Sergeant Thrakal is with Pontiac Community Police. I've, 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 I've okay. called that one too. It's ours. <laughs> okay. We'll set up a meeting and we'll go talk. To okay. Thank you. One of the things you talk about the schools that we have to recognize, and, and I sympathize as well, the school boards have a lot of say on what we what, what the superintendents will allow in the schools, the principals will allow in the schools. So those are some of the concerns. If you're not getting 
the school boards are who you really need to address um, because they have such a, they do have some control over what can be done in the schools. So, as we're voting for our school board members, let's find out what their their mentality what, what they are, you know, what they believe in. I will I will tell you that our voices need to be heard. Uh, the school board does not recognize this as what they refer to as a tier two problem. And I'll give you a definition of what a tier two problem looks like. More deaths. We don't have enough deaths in that category to make it mandatory in our school district. I don't know about you, but the value of human life isn't on the backs of numbers of fatalities. So that's the first place we can start. This is not a tier two issue. It's a tier one issue. It needs to be addressed right now. And it needs to have the same sense of urgency as brought you all here tonight. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Robert Branner. Um, I'm a, on the emergency response team at General Motors. As the sheriff was talking about the Narcan, I was kind of kind of explaining to the nurses at General Motors, hey, you know, we're the first ones on scene. We have a lot of people that do come in there and be, you know, high. And also, I just recently, it's been a year, a big year at the end of this month that I lost my daughter to fentanyl. And this is, I tell anybody, this is a pain and nobody, I don't wish on no parent. Um, but I have a question for the DEA agent, is that how do we, can we get like someone actually gave it to her? I don't, I don't, I don't want to necessarily say she purchased it from, but she basically was asking the gentleman where can he get it from, and in return he went and got it for her and gave it to her. She thought she was taking Percocets, but it was actually the peel press form of fentanyl. So I'm just questioning you, how can we go after the people that actually gave it to her? So, Sir, we can, we do. Those cases are, are very difficult to prove. They're not as easy to prove. Um, you know, it's, it's actually um, an enhancement when someone causing serious bodily injury or death. So it's actually an enhancement federally uh, when that happens. So a number of things come into play. Um, like I said before, you know, so I'm responsible for Michigan and, and Ohio as well. Um, in Northern, uh, some uh, counties in Northern Kentucky, but in Cincinnati, for example, uh, Cincinnati has a very good uh, response, not just on the side of where you know there's an OD and 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 um, uh, resources and folks like these folks here go out and they have that intervention, but also whenever an, a fatal overdose happens, you know there's a team of the investigators that go out. They collect the phones, they collect the evidence at the scene because it's you know if you're looking at it, it it's and and also the uh, the medical examiner they have an entire team that's dialed in. And so the medical examiner knows exactly what, um, you know, what she's looking for in those instances. Because if we don't take the phone, we don't talk to the witnesses, um, you know, the pills that are left over uh, get trashed or, or don't get handled properly, then that makes it even that much more difficult for us to, um, you know, to actually prosecute that case. And it's not just on the federal side, it's a partnership. So with the, the lo that local department, that local jurisdiction that that occurs in also has to be on the same page, right? So these cases are prosecuted um, locally as well by the state and as well as, as federally. And, you know, we have to find that, that space where, where is it more appropriate? Yeah, I know her mom, she did have evidence in her phone of the person, of them communicating, because I had seen her like, two days before she passed away. She left behind two kids, a five-year-old and my grandbaby, she just turned one. They were there at the house the day it happened. I will never forget that phone call. And it happened in Detroit, so go figure. Yeah, we, we do prosecute those cases, sir, but, uh, and you know, again, like I said, it's, the, the, the cops who are showing up on that scene initially have to know what they're doing. They have to be trained in that aspect. Right. right. Um, you know, and, and in my office, we have a great working relationship with uh, with Detroit, you know. But again, if, if we get a phone call, if I get a phone call, 
say, hey, Orville, we have this thing. We need your people. I'm having people there. But again, we're not going out. Like, I don't just, you know, come to Oakland County and tell Sheriff Bashar, I don't think anyone can do that. Hey, this is what we're doing. You know, again, it's a, it's a partnership. If, if the sheriff says to me, hey, Orville, let's work out this response, right? And you bring your resources, then we've got it. Same thing. You know, I, I, I live in Chief Gallagher's uh, town, you know, so whatever he wants, he knows where I live. He can just come to my house and get me. Um, but it, it's about the partnership and it's about uh, the, the proper training um, and, and also um, the, co the, 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 we need that cooperation as well from the family. So there are different, there are different um, aspects to this whole thing. It's not as easy as it sounds. Um, it, it, it is pretty, um, it, it, there, there's some, some pitfalls to trying to prosecute these cases, but it, it is possible. But what happens initially when that first unit shows up on that scene really sometimes makes or breaks um, the opportunity to have an investigation. Well, I, oh, go ahead. Just, uh, I mean, it is a homicide in Michigan. We do have basically a drug-induced homicide law here in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And um, I know parents who, they were, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the oil, where they pressed and pressed and pressed, mm -hmm. and, you know, months or even years or so after their child's death, they finally mm -hmm. got an arrest yeah. because they, they pounded it. They just, you know, would not quit and even like went to the media and, you know, and just, just wouldn't quit. And they finally got some arrests and, you know, the but you sometimes, sometimes. I, I know her her it, her mom said that she was there when it happened. Like she got the call, and she said Detroit police act basically like nonchalant because basically like they deal with this every day. That, that, yeah, that's also I'm sorry, Jim. That's also part ahead. of the problem. But I, I will say this as well: even though we may not be able to arrest that person and charge him with with your daughter's death, there's still a case there to be made, right? This is a drug dealer, and you know, oftentimes we don't get that top charge but you know removing this individual from from the street is also again it, it it's a win yeah and i think one thing that what, what a lot of communities don't understand is and one thing that we we as as organizations have to do especially right now with the with the problem with recruitment and retention law enforcement is that i have a member assigned to the Oakland county narcotics team and if i if i have the stats correctly 2006 2007 uh, oakland county narcotics was one of the first task force to actually get a delivery causing death case and it was actually a 15 year old young, uh, young lady out of uh, lived in Bloomfield Township where she was a Birmingham Groves uh, student. What has to happen is getting rid of the stigma when parents are losing their children to talk to the police. Oakland County there's a hidden group of men um, out there and women out there on a task force that work countless hours on the narcotics enforcement team and they partner with DEA to combat these things and I can tell you I know a lot of them who take these cases especially when there's a death involved and I, and I hate to say some are more important than the others but we all know we're, we're we're touched by youth correct so when when it's a high school student they're more than willing to spend many hours and I, I can tell you on the on the sheriff's behalf with many conversations the amount of resources that he's willing to throw at it with that team that we have to communicate you as a parent can sit down even though it happened in the city of Detroit if you're an Oakland County resident, say, hey, I want to sit down with, with one of these narcotics detectives, show them what we have, because we, if we can just put that phone number in a, in a database or that name or that nickname into a database, maybe today we can't do a case because it's so weak, but maybe two days from now, maybe a week from now, maybe a year from now, they can tie that phone number back to somebody that can make, make or break a whole case just because of, we don't think it's important this moment. We can maybe do something that's great. It, but it, all it takes is that simple phone call to your substation if you're, or, or local police department and ask them. And it's also putting the pressure on us. Yeah, you're paying for a police officer in a jurisdiction that's working for the county. Um, but they're responding regionally in, to a problem that's affecting all of us. You know, we'll, I'll see you after. We'll, we'll talk. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. And I just want to reiterate that point that while you know it may be more challenging to get delivery causing death uh, you do have a drug dealer and so that may be something that at least can be done to take this person off the street and out of action from causing another death and, and as the chief said 
we, we have successfully prosecuted for delivery causing death with our narcotics enforcement team in the past year. So if we can, we will. Um, if we can't, we'll look for another avenue. And, you know, I get daily reports and regular things from our narcotics team. And my first question is, have we reached the end? You know, or can we climb higher? Can we get where that person got it? Can we go higher? And when we can't go higher, then, okay, let's release it to the public so they're aware of what's going on. Because I'm a big person about transparency and disclosure. Because, you know, as somebody said, How do, I didn't know about it happening in our community. So I sometimes talk about it, and I think people unfriend me because I talk so much about stuff that they don't want to hear about it anymore. But, you know, that's a part of it, you know. And then um, the one other point that was raised about the um, drug take-back day, just so we're clear, every substation has a, a, a basically like a blockbuster kind of vehicle in it where you can drop off your drugs all the time, not just on drug take back day. Drug take back day we participate in, we will again this year, uh, we're, we're conjoining it with an Earth Day kind of thing, shredding and all that stuff. But every day you can go to a police station, you can go on our website, oaklandsheriff.com, and look for um, Operation Medicine Cabinet, and it will give you a list where you can take drugs anytime to a police department and drop them off, no questions asked. I want to just add one last thing. As you leave here today, if you pull the door open to that Save-A-Life station, there are bags of deterra that you can safely dispose of your prescription medications at home, throw it in the garbage. All the things we talked about, lists of resources for county available resources, there's a complete list of all of those partners inside that box. It's not just Narcan, grab it, there's the SSU. So these things are here and maybe it's our job to communicate those better, but just take a peek when you look out there. There's a wealth of knowledge inside those little powerful boxes um, and it's widely available. As a nurse and an educator of my patients and um, proponent for my patients, I'm always looking for resources for those patients and for information that can have in my office. And I think if you were to go to the primary care physicians of the various hospitals and an organization called OPNS located here in Pontiac, um, is an organization of Oakland County physicians. And they make um, distributing information to the physicians very easy. And I think that your organizations, they're wonderful, but it's not getting out. I'm not aware of these um, resources that are available for our clientele in the community. And I know my clientele are not aware of it either. So we're um, at a crossroads of how to educate the community about the resources that we have available. And that's what we really need to do. Yeah, and I don't disagree, and that's why we try to have outreach like this, town halls and things. But you know, I have personally spoke to physicians groups at Beaumont, I've spoke to physician prescribing networks. I have interacted with Oakland County Medical Society. So, you know, it depends on where you're consuming your news or where you're consuming your information. And the more outlets that we have, the more we share and communicate, the more likely that message is gonna be heard. But we've been trying to, to fill this room for a month and a half. And I guarantee you tomorrow, somebody will see this on the news or read it in the paper and go, geez, I didn't know about it. We and, well, that, that, I, that's why I went on there and we did a follow-up press release about it, but it's been on our Facebook page for a month and a half. We've done it press releases in advance. I mean, we do everything we can. And the problem is, is, as you said, there's so many ways people get their information, ways they consume their news, um, as my daughter would say, she's in that business. And it's, it's like a scatter shot. It's really tough to, to get the information out um, on so many different things.
but we're, we're not dissuaded at all. And I'm super proud of our team and their innovation and their partnership. Um, and, and we're just going to keep banging the drum and, until the noise gets overwhelming. But I know we, we're hoping to get everybody out of here by 9, but it's, a, I think, a testament to not only your passion about this issue, but your uh, willingness to share and help and open your pain up and you know, make a difference. I, I, I want to thank our, our panel that is here because they work a lot of nights um, all the time, but they're here not because they're getting overtime, because none of them are. Uh, they're here because they care. So thank you.